agent or applicant in attendance. Do you wish to speak? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, does anyone else uh, wish to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone here that wishes to speak in general or in opposition to the application? Okay, with that, we'll close the public meeting. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, moved by Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? And that's carried. Any further questions of councillors for staff? Councillor Van Passen. Oh, I just have one question. Um, so in terms of um, meeting the requirements, there is, um, the, uh, I guess I'm just wondering a little bit of the background here for, for the need for the garden suite in order to, to meet that component. Could you touch on that? Uh, certainly to you. Uh, Planning staff did receive a letter of justification from the applicant to confirm that a legitimate and justified need for the suite exists. Typically, we see circumstances where it's family members um, housing either a family member that needs support or an aging family member that wishes to age in place on the same property. And then once that need no longer exists, what is Norfolk County's sort of policy to ensure that the, the trailer is removed? Uh, again, to you, that would be through bylaw enforcement. Should a bylaw terminate and the trailer the trailers still exist on the property after the expiration date? And do we have any sort of monitoring program in place for that? Uh, thank you, Mayor Chop. Uh, yes, we do have a, a tracking system in place uh, where we have a, a listing of all the garden suites that are in uh, that have been applied for that a temporary use bylaws apply to. Um, and uh, when they are coming due, we do send them a letter saying uh, your bylaw is, uh, your, your temporary use is coming to expiration. Um, if you wish to extend it, please contact us so that we can help you with an application process or please make um, opportunities or, or please make arrangements to have it removed. Um, and then uh, typically the, we will follow up with either uh, correspondence. If we don't hear back from them, we'll, we'll try and get in touch with them again um, or do site inspections um, after that time as well to see if the uh, suite, if, if an extension hasn't been requested or uh, gone through that process, that the, uh, that the suite is removed. And if not, then we do contact uh, by law enforcement um, to take next steps for removal. I guess the, the kind of the reason I'm driving at these questions, I started reading a little bit kind of into this is, you know, we're seeing a greater need for garden suites and so on and other municipalities, I mean, Vancouver, they're talking about, you know, kind of a huge rush that's happened out there with this, but um, it's that tax, you're not receiving any tax um, benefit from all of these garden suites taking place. And so some municipalities I think are actually looking at uh, changing that and I'm just wondering if you guys have looked into any of that or I mean we are as a municipality providing additional services so I I know that this council feels strongly about supporting these garden suites and encouraging this type of development in Norfolk County which I'm fully in support of I just want to ensure that we don't support it to a point where you know it ends up costing us uh, through you, Mayor, Mayor Chop, that those are excellent points to raise, um, and this is something um, that I think is can be explored more through uh, the Bill 108 legislation that's been passed. We're looking into that, uh, and um, also uh, you'll see a report on uh, the next uh, agenda for tiny home opportunities that's following up some council requests on that. Um, so I think that'll give some opportunities um, to, to potentially explore further that way. Uh, some of the garden suites uh, policies were to provide assistant living circumstances. Um, so there could be a difference between uh, some of the assisted living needs uh, versus uh, secondary suites, uh, but that is something um, that we can definitely explore uh, through some uh, further review and, and policy stuff. Thank you. Councillor Van Passen. Seconded by Councillor Geisen. So, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, sorry, put your hands back down, Councillor Rabbits. <laughs> sorry, fellow councillors. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. I did have a question for our planning staff. I've been um, looking at the period of 11 years, and I understand that we have a policy that, that dictates or allows us to grant that 11 year temporary usage, three years thereafter, up to a maximum of 20. Um, 
but I was wondering if you might be able to provide some context as to how Norfolk County arrived at that 11-year mark. Um, without doing that research, I found it to be a little bit arbitrary. We've had a number of different garden suites proposed, and some of the, um, the homeowners have even articulated that they weren't really seeking the 11 years. It was something that um, was advised to them through our policy documents. And I understand that in the past, it was five years and three years leading up to that 20 mark as a, as a maximum. And I'm just wondering you know, how we arrived at the 11, if you could maybe provide some context that I'm unaware of uh, why that seems to be the, the starting point for, for these garden suites and for this temporary usage. Uh, through you, Mayor Chop, to Council Rabbit's questions. Um, it was previously five years, um, and it was amended uh, to the 11 years. Um, because we were seeing a number of um, garden suites coming back repeatedly, um, so what the 11 years does is it ga gains that those additional two extensions, essentially, to add up to uh, from the five years to 11. So it takes away two need, the, the need for two applications or two requests for extension. The 11 years provided uh, a, an appropriate timeline based on some of the applications that we were seeing, as well as the opportunity for three more extensions to get up to that 20 years. Um, so that's kind of the, some of the rationale behind that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Next report is uh, staff report DCS 19-76. That's an application that has been received to rezone the subject lands from neighborhood industrial zone to Hamlet residential zone with a special prov provision to permit a total of three residential dwelling units, including a semi-detached dwelling on one lot. In addition, relief is requested from the zoning bylaw to permit a front yard setback for an existing semi-detached dwelling of 2.8 meters and an interior side yard setback of 0.5 meters and zero meter interior side yard with a garage setback for an existing single detached dwelling and 136.6 square meters for all accessory structures. Uh, Frank and Maria Newdorf have put forth the application affecting the lands described as 2027 Main Street, Walsingham. I now open the public meeting on staff report DCS 19-76 and Matt Vaughn, will you be presenting that report? Thanks. Thank you very much. I will try to keep this short and sweet. Um, so uh, as the mayor pointed out, the applicant has uh, requested an amendment from the neighborhood institutional zone to the Hamlet residential zone. The, uh, the lands are uh, designated Hamlet as well in our official plan. Uh, staff have reviewed the policies, the provincial policy statement, our official plan and um, have reviewed um, the neighborhood er uh, area, the community, and uh, in this case, I uh, believe that in, uh, the application is consistent with the policies of the PPS and conform with the policies, oops, sorry, <laughs> of our official plan and therefore recommend approval. Thanks, Matt. Any questions from councillors? Okay, is the applicant or agent in attendance? Good evening, Council. I'm uh, David Rowe, a planning consultant and agent for the applicant. I'm here to really answer any questions that Council might have. A little bit of history. The uh, property formerly housed a uh, uh, Mennonite church uh, and Mennonite school. At one point, I understand they had three portable classrooms and the main uh, building, church building. Uh, plus an existing dwelling. A uh, number of years ago, the church moved to another location. Uh, they removed two of the, uh, of the three portable classrooms, and then the building was subsequently uh, uh, purchased, uh, used to uh, uh, provide accommodation, what have you. Uh, but my clients purchased it uh, earlier, well, I guess at the end of last year, and uh, uh, thought that they would like to make get the zoning uh, uh, properly regularized, uh, meet the building code uh, with respect to the uh, conversion of the uh, of the former church to to uh, residential units, 
and to also ensure that the on-site septic system is up to par, uh, which we found kind of after the fact that it was, it was actually designed for, for the school and uh, uh, it's more than adequate for the, uh, for the proposed uses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Questions from councillors? Okay, thank you. Does anyone um, wish to speak in favor of the application? Does anyone wish to speak in general or in opposition to the application? Any further questions from councillors? Can I have a motion to close the public meeting? Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Geisens. All those in favor? And that's carried. Would somebody like to move the staff recommendation or propose an alternative? Councillor Geisens. And seconded by Council Taylor. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, now we are on to uh, staff report DCS 19-78. That's a zoning bylaw amendment that is proposed to amend the definition of cannabis production and processing to clarify the use as industrial. Norfolk County has put forth the application affecting all lands within Norfolk County. Before I open the public meeting, I just want to clarify from what is included in our agenda. Um, I've rewatched the video and I believe there is an error that the uh, zoning bylaw was approved with the exception of the industrial classification. Um, and so we are not debating the setbacks or anything else this evening. It is strictly whether or not uh, cannabis is, uh, sh should be classified uh, as an industrial product. So um, that will be the content of the public meeting. Uh, at that, so at this point, I'd now like to open the public meeting on staff report DCS 19-78. And Mr. Vaughn, if you could please present your report. Yes, and thank you for that clarification, Mayor Chop. So on May 28th, staff presented uh, the proposed cannabis production and processing update to council, and then some discussion uh, followed in regards to the clarification of whether or not cannabis production and processing uh, is considered an industrial use. And, and I think what, I, what I'd like to do is take council back to when we originally developed the cannabis production and processing policy. And that was back in March of 2018. At that time, we removed this particular use from the definition of farm. And when we did that, we did that uh, very specifically because at, the at that time, we already didn't consider this use to be an agricultural use. Um, there are a lot of reasons why cannabis, uh, both production and processing, uh, shouldn't be considered agricultural. Uh, the main reason is that it offers a significant amount of land use conflict with everything around it. Um, and that's somewhat similar to how industrial operations operate. Uh, one of the other uh, main differences uh, between this particular product and, and another uh, type of agricultural commodity is how it's grown. Um, it, it really does require a certain amount of isolation uh, in, in comparison with other types of agricultural crops. For instance, if there is a hemp plant or a male version of it anywhere nearby within five to ten kilometers and it gets cross-pollinated, um, the type of product, the, no, the amount of CBD or THC that's generated from it is diminished quite significantly. It goes to seed. It doesn't uh, produce the kind of crop or, or production that uh, was originally intended. And I think a lot of the industry is starting to catch on to this. So what they're starting to do is take these plants and enclose them in more factory type buildings. Some are being housed in barns, but for the most part they're being housed in uh, buildings with, uh, with, you know, the four walls, the roof. They're implementing and using air treatment control and they're doing that because otherwise um, they're going to have pollen in these facilities. Uh, the benefit to fit uh, the county in this case is that um, they have to control both the air coming in and the air going out. So the nice part about that is that the, the folks who are growing this properly um, don't have odor issues. Um, the folks that aren't growing this properly um, do have odor issues. And that's why we originally impl also implemented um, the option for those folks to be able to uh, have a 300 meter separation distance. So um, getting, getting back to some of the concerns that were raised by council uh, on the evening of May 28th, uh, we looked, planning staff looked into a number of uh, um, issues that may or may not have uh, existed. The, the first one was whether or not hydro rates would increase as a result of us classifying uh, cannabis 
production and processing as an industrial use in our zoning bylaw. And the, um, the resulting conversation uh, with uh, several hydro representatives was that it, was, it would not. Uh, hydro One just simply doesn't look at our zoning bylaw when they come up with their hydro rates. Um, they do uh, look at a number of other things, which I've included in my report, but um, the, the way we classify it in our zoning is not one of them. We also looked at whether or not uh, municipal property taxes would be affected. And again, it's, it's not one of the considerations MPAC has is they don't, they don't use our zoning bylaw when uh, developing the property tax class. Um, and the last thing that we looked at is whether or not it had any building code implications. And again, it does not. What it does do is it closes a loophole that may exist uh, for part two facilities. And, and I'm going to explain this a little bit later to council, the difference between the, the different types and forms of cannabis production. But um, what it essentially does is it, it clarifies that the county looks at this not as agricultural, but as industrial, and therefore uh, shuts down an argument that if a farmer has been uh, growing any kind of agricultural product there in the past, that what they're doing now is agricultural, and therefore it can, may be considered legal nonconforming, and that's simply not how uh, planning staff look at this. It's a very different product that it creates. It has very different land use implications. And as such, uh, planning staff um, have concluded that we, we, it's a pharmaceutical or industrial product. Now, that's not to say that it, uh, it's not permitted in the ag area. In fact, we're not suggesting that the permissions of the agricultural zone be changed at this time. We're, um, that's not part of the discussion. So uh, cannabis production and processing uh, will uh, remain permitted in the agricultural area, just like it is in the industrial areas. Um, it's just to say that we consider the use to be industrial, um, and, and that's about it. That's about it for that, that part of that conversation. So I think that more or less summarizes it. Oh, another question that was brought up uh, in May 28th as well uh, was to look at different forms of industrial um, production, uh, looking at different, uh, in, in comparison to the number of employees that are used in um, cannabis production and processing. Uh, and we, we compared, uh, we looked at several different facilities that we have currently in the county uh, and compared them with some of our really big industries, so Toyo Tetsu or uh, Titan Trailers. And it's pretty clear that when we do compare these different kinds of businesses, Toyo Tetsu and um, Titan Trailers, they, they just have a lot more employees for the square footage of the facility. Um, and that's, I, I, I expected that. Um, um, with um, the mechanization of the cannabis industry. I think we, we can maybe expect there to be less and less employees working in these facilities in the future. But that's not to say that there are other businesses that exist in our industrial areas that don't have a lot of employees, like warehousing, for instance. Lots of warehouses in our industrial areas, um, and they also don't have lots, uh, too many employees. So um, anyway, just Staff provided those details in the report, uh, and if there's any questions about those numbers, we'd be happy to answer them. But the, the recommendation today is that um, the zoning bylaw amendment ZNPL 2019-2012 uh, be approved for all the reasons set out in the report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, thanks, Matt. Just one point of clarification again. The zoning bylaw has been approved. We are strictly determining whether or not we are going to include uh, cannabis as a, an industrial Yeah, product. that that is correct. And, and as such, this was created separately for that. Okay, any questions from councillors? Councillor Rabbits. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to Matt. Matt, thank you for this detailed and articulate report. Uh, I did have one question that uh, is uh, very common for industrial facilities, and that's noise. Um, the amount of HVAC that's required to heat or cool uh, these facilities that employ a large amount of people, the fans uh, required to regulate the air, uh, they can rattle, they might be uh, hard fixed to the building to start, but without preventative maintenance and adequate repair, those fans can uh, then become quite noisy. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe speak to um, the noise variant uh, that does come with uh, cannabis production. Through the mayor, um, we've, we've heard from the community that several of the part two facilities um, which uh, are using older technology, older blower fans and that sort of thing, uh, where the maintenance isn't kept up on those systems, the noise can be uh, quite excessive. Um, 
I, we haven't heard those complaints from the facilities that are in our industrial area or from the facilities um, that are using more of the, the newer technology and, and it's likely just because the newer technology doesn't come with those, those shortfalls. Um, it, it'll be something that we need to probably continuously monitor as we move along and, and get a better understanding of this industry and, and what the future of it's going to be in Norfolk. Thank you, Councillor Rabbits. Further questions from councillors? Um, okay, so I have a couple myself before we get going. Um, first of all, in terms of um, the argument that uh, because there is cross-pollination that that makes this an industrial product, I'm just wondering if you could sort of explain that because I, I think a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, they use cross-pollination. Um, maybe just to clarify, that isn't the only explanation of why it's an industrial product, but, but rather uh, a part of the explanation why we would consider it that way. Um, in order to grow it properly, it needs to be grown in a certain kind of facility that controls both air in and air out. If you're growing it in a, that type of facility um, and not a greenhouse, uh, just with open, open vents, open sides, um, it, it if it starts to, to look and feel like industrial because of that type and form of building, it, it, it starts to take on that, that sort of uh, that classification. I guess I struggle with that because I just spent um, the other afternoon touring a number of very large scale agricultural operations in Norfolk County. Um, everything from asparagus and tomatoes and the processing equipment uh, that I saw was far beyond anything that you are seeing in a cannabis um, operation in terms of processing. And as far as us moving to uh, industrial buildings now, it's not that we're moving to industrial buildings. In fact, the government, when this began, legislated that it could only be contained within uh, fully enclosed structures. It's now the federal government is unfortunately relaxing those rules and allowing outdoor growing. So we're actually moving less stringently from the federal government as opposed to us moving to a more industrial look because of the types of buildings. Um, that's always, that's, that was the starting point. Uh, for myself, I completely support um, the challenges or, or abolishing sort of these part twos that are operating illegally. Um, I just don't feel that classifying this as an industrial product advances that cause at all. This is a lobbying with the federal government to change their rules as to how can a doctor make a prescription for an individual for 400 plants. Well, how Norfolk County classifies that isn't going to change it. Um, I did have a conversation, I just wanna ask you one more question here with one of the counselors and um, I had heard that part of the argument was this idea of preventing a legal non or conforming use in the future as a result of a use that was previously in an agricultural building. If the use in the agricultural building wasn't legal to begin with, there is no provision for maintaining that as a legal non-conforming use now. So a cannabis operation that was originally in this agricultural greenhouse illegally doesn't assume legal non-conforming status after the fact. One of the definitions I just pulled up here, a legal non-conforming use is one that was in place prior to the adoption of the zoning ordinance or one which was constructed with a zoning variance. An illegal use is one that violates the zoning and is not a legal non-conforming use. It would, it would not continue to be, it would not now be a legal non-conforming if it wasn't legal in the past. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any comments on, on that. If you could sort of touch more how you believe that this is going to close the loop on the part twos because I think there's a lot that this council and myself can do to try to close the loop on the part twos and I will give it everything I have to go and do that. I just don't think that classifying cannabis as an industrial product is the way to make that happen. Um, sure, sure, yeah. And, um, I'll, I'll double back a little bit as well on the production end of it. Um, there, there aren't a lot of other agricultural products that require barbed wire fence and such high level of security that cannabis does. Uh, and it gets, again, back to that sort of use and look and function of the property. And when, when cannabis is grown on a property, and 
granted that's a federal requirement and hopefully that never changes but um, it, it, it's something that again it, it lends itself to that um, that feeling that industrial feeling but uh, and getting uh, back to your your point about legal non-conforming you're absolutely correct it's uh, it had to have been legal at some point first but th the argument that we have heard as staff isn't necessarily that um, I'm I'm growing cannabis and it's legal non-conforming it's that I'm growing an agricultural product and because I'm growing an agricultural product that was legal in the past and therefore it is legal now um, so by us designating and classifying it as industrial um, we're, we're closing the loop on those those uh, occurrences that start up now to say that it's not it's not uh, agricultural it's not agricultural now it's not agricultural then it's, this is this is our interpretation of the product but people can make all kinds of arguments that doesn't mean that they're right so I don't know how that would change our enforcement abilities because somebody says well it was an agricultural product that was once in our building that's just I, I still don't understand how this closes the loop on loophole on the part twos and if I did believe that it did I would advocate uh, fiercely for this change but uh, from a legal perspective, I just don't see how, how that has anything um, to do with it. One last question just before we move on is in terms of the staff numbers, I'm just um, wondering how you, you spoke that this sort of was an indication of, of industrial. I just I don't understand how they kind of fit in here. No, sorry, just to clarify that the, the comparison was requested by council at May 28th, and that's why that comparison chart was added to this report. I think I was maybe the one that had requested it, but I, I requested it from the perspective of uh, Norfolk County, and I believe yourself, actually, when I first met you, you wanted Norfolk to be the cannabis sort of capital of, of Canada, and um, there was talk of Delhi and, and so on, of, of um, expanding that industry of looking to Fanshawe, you know, looking to Guelph, how can we, you know, re, you know, get ourselves involved in research um, for the LPs that are doing good, not for the part twos. And so my point was we've gone and we've got all these, these LPs that are here now, and we, I believe they all believe that this is an agricultural product. Um, and the point was we're employing a number of people in Norfolk County uh, in this industry because planning staff has actually has recommended it along the way. In fact, we've, since this council has come into play, we've sold a great deal of industrial land to uh, producers as well. Um, and I've made my point clear before that I actually, that concerns me to a degree because we have a limited amount of industrial land and we shouldn't be putting them all on our very limited amount of industrial land. We should be getting them away from the town and out uh, on, on agricultural space. So um, what would be your comments? I'm just wondering why sort of there's, there's language in here to show how many more employees Toya Tetsu and, and Titan trailers have. I just don't understand the tie-in with that. Uh, the tie-in was, it's just to show the comparison between how one industry compares to another. It's not to take away anything from the cannabis industry. In fact, I, I agree with you. Norfolk is very well positioned to be the cannabis production and processing capital. Um, and I think we just, we need it's, to continue in that direction. And okay. But we need to do so uh, cautiously and we need to do so in, in, a, in a regulatory way to, to ensure that the community uh, isn't uh, um, affected by, by it as well. To me, it almost makes it seem like perhaps that's more indicative of industry um, as opposed to the suggestion that sort of, you know, the, the type of a building um, or barbed wire fence is a definition of, of, of what is an, uh, an industrial product. Um, okay, any further questions from councillors? Councillor Rabbit. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to uh, Matt, since we, we seem to be engaged in a bit of a, a discourse or a debate regarding your report, and I, I just want to comment that I do believe this is an industrial product. I respect that this will close a gap um, for those Part 2 facilities. I understand very well um, how someone saying I grew 400 tomatoes means legal nonconforming. I can grow 400 or more marijuana, cannabis plants. 
And I do believe that this classification will allow us to have more regulatory authority uh, to close those gaps, and I understand that very well. My question to you, and again, I'm not necessarily wanting to debate respectfully, uh, Madam Mayor, um, on that topic, uh, but I have a difference of opinion, and I respect yours as you've presented today. My question to you, as I've stated a matter of fact, um, is what benefit would be uh, in terms of a regulatory capacity for keeping it within the agricultural zone um, and keeping that classification, would, would there be any benefit to Norfolk County or would that uh, give us any mechanisms? Uh, would there be any benefit to doing so? Because I don't see any disadvantage. Uh, we've reviewed hydro rates, we've reviewed tax rates, we've brought up a number of different suggestions that you have come back with a detailed report, made inquiries, I don't see what the disadvantage would be in classifying this as a pharmaceutical or an industrial grade product. Um, and that's my question to you is, you know, what, what would be um, the benefit of keeping it in the agricultural zone? Because I see many benefits for changing it to the industrial class and we would not be the only municipality uh, to do so. Uh, th through the mayor and um, thank you for, for bringing that question up. Um, I agree, and in, in, from my perspective, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have any disadvantage. Um, we look at this as a, as a medicinal pharmaceutical use. It's an industrial use. Um, it's a matter of how it's grown in the, in the matter of uh, land use conflict it introduces. Um, it closes a loop. Um, I, I would feel a lot more comfortable standing before a land use tribunal uh, arguing the fact that it's industrial if it's identified that way in our zoning bylaw. Um, so I, yeah, hopefully that provides a good answer. Thank you. Any further questions from councillors? Councillor Van Passen. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through you to staff, um, I think you mentioned like there's no intention that it's going to change the tax bracket because MPAC does that. And, um, is that just hope or, or is that a commitment that it's going to stay taxed as the agricultural rate? Because I think we've had other instances in the past with uh, like the cherry plant, the uh, fruit growers and things like that where we got an argument with MPAC about what level of taxation they were supposed to pay. pay. So uh, could you extrapolate on that any? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, through the mayor, so we, we had those conversations with uh, our tax department and um, just bluntly, they said they don't look at zoning. There's a number of other factors that they look at, particularly it's the use um, that they would look at. So for instance, if, um, if there was a, I don't wanna, uh, some sort of a commercial use in the agricultural area, it wouldn't be looked at, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall under agricultural tax, it would fall under uh, a commercial tax. And who, who determines that whether it's commercial or not is, is, is MPAC, it's not it's the county, they don't, um, they don't really, uh, mind what what we have in our zoning bylaw, uh, and in terms of the future, I'm I'm not certain uh, what what they'll do with uh, that product in the future and how they'll classify it. But uh, today, it's it's classified um, as an agri agricultural uh, commodity, but it's just not something that staff agree with. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak uh, in favor of the application? And again, this is only in relation to the industrial classification, not the setbacks. Mr. Hallier. Oh. So my name is Laura Cloet. I live at 680 Concession 14 Townsend. You all probably know me very well now. Um, I know when making decisions, you often like to look at comparisons. Um, in terms of what other municipalities have done and what might they um, classify um, cannabis as. And just as a quick look, um, I was able to find in a planning report done for Halton Hills that they put together sort of a, um, a what different municipalities have done. And the city of Markham completed a study in 2014 that concluded commercial production of medical marijuana was an industrial use. So just an example of another municipality that has done so, and perhaps we should as well. That is all, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Mr. Hallier.
<clears throat> Madam Mayor, my name is Peter Hellier, and I would like to speak in support of zoning applications ZNP L 2019 212 that clarifies the definition of cannabis production and processing as industrial. I would first of all like to speak to what it is not. It is not agriculture. Cannabis was governed mainly by the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act, Section 2, until the writing of the Cannabis Act. And I say mainly because there were other aspects of law as well as the criminal code. I can grow opium poppies, no problem in a Norfolk County greenhouse, meaning that the required cultivation conditions can be met to make it grow. But it would not be legal land use because it is a controlled substance. I likewise can cultivate coca plants, no problem in a Norfolk County greenhouse, again meaning that the required cultivation conditions can be met to make it grow, but again it would not be legal land use as it is a controlled substance. The Cannabis Act did not change the fact that cannabis is a controlled substance. When we say something is, industri is industry, we are not referring to the means of production, but for the need to buffer. In the case of cannabis, it needs a lot of buffering, as odor, light, possibly its sewage, are not compatible with sensitive land use. Just because the means of production may be cultivation does not exclude it from being industry. The buffering required of this process makes it industry. And further, the infrastructure demands are best served in terms of available electricity within the grid in industrial areas. Substantial setbacks to sensitive land use have been endorsed by Norfolk County Council, and I am pleased to report that this argument has been considered persuasive and has provided proof for court injunctions in British Columbia to shut down illegal dispensaries. But we should not be naive about the challenges that we are facing in the days ahead. One dispensary in Toronto uh, has interlocking concrete blocks brought in by a tractor trailer and placed by a crane to force the closure. There was about 100 tons of interlocking concrete. Acting Inspector Millison told you last month who we are dealing with with these grow operations that I have termed let's pretend to be legal. And especially difficult when we have 50. The good news is that there was one grow up that was scheduled for a hearing tonight that has been deferred as they are trying to become compliant. That's great. That's what we want. But I expect that some will be very recalcitrant and we will have to use extreme measures to either clean them up if they meet setbacks and buffering from sensitive land use or shut them down. It gives me no pleasure that other communities are facing this type of grow up problem. <coughs> There's one at 398 Upper Centennial Parkway in Stony Creek. The residents nearby have termed the odor suffocating. To quote one, it belongs in an industrial area. But I can't help but editorialize in this one because it claims to have a license for 22,000 plants versus the 1,300 at 681 14th Street that they allege to have a license for. Uh, and that was compares to the 5,000 plants that they had when they were rated by the OPP. But it is an illustrative of a licensing program run amok to say the least. 22,000 plants times four crops per year, divided by four individuals for personal use, means that each individual smokes 33 pounds of cannabis per day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And to picture 33 pounds, you need to visual, you're gonna to have to become a farmer here. Um, a farmer, when he bales, goes to a windrow with a baling machine and the baler picks up either hay or straw and it gets compressed with a piston and it gets thrown by a catapult into a wagon behind. They weigh 35 pounds. So the bale is going to be like this, it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like this, and it's going to be strapped in with baler twine. And if you cut the twine, it's going to explode all over the floor. That's how much they're claiming to be 
smoking each and every day. And I don't know how anybody can believe this. Mr. Hollier, if I could just keep you on, we're just debating whether or not it's an industrial product at this Getting, point. That, well, that was, that's part of it, for sure. Um, there were a few other matters mentioned last month with respect to the cost of electricity. Uh, my suggestion is that you ask the concerned individuals to contact the Ontario Energy Board and provide evidence at the next hydro rate hearing. Uh, I would suggest the same thing if you get complaints about property taxes as the request for review and assessment review board appeals procedure is very user friendly and it's exactly what the rest of us have had to do in business many times before. Um, given that an, an election is to be held within a few months, I believe that there will be substantive changes in the regulations as noted in the planner's report over the course of the summer, but we need to show extreme solidarity with the affected families so that they know that Norfolk is steadfast and resolute and focused and is prepared to take bold action so that during this long, stinky summer, they know that help is on the way. So, Madam Mayor, you have some questions. Any questions? I don't think so. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Thank you. I'm Stacy. I have nothing. Um, no paper bags this time. Good. <laughs> I wasn't actually going to speak. I wasn't prepared to speak. Matt, you do a phenomenal job, first of all, I would like to say. I'm not sure by not changing the term or changing the term. I'll agree with you on one part. I don't know legally down the road will it or won't it make a difference. But what I think needs to happen is we need to support a county staff member who is going to be the one standing before different tribunals trying to help all of Norfolk County. And I think by giving Matt a tool to do that collectively from everybody to show support and help the community, I think moves in a more positive direction than put Matt or somebody else in the position to try and defend the other way. It's, you can make the argument, but then your time spent making the argument, not moving forward. I think if it turns out that we really didn't need to do that, well, let's be overactive instead of underactive. Be progressive, not the other way. That's all. Thanks, Thanks Susie. Anyone else? Okay, does anyone wish to speak in opposition to the application? My name is Sue Dagg, and I represent Ayanda Cannabis Corporation. We have, um, we have a license. We, well, not yet. We applied for a license. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a perspective of what it's like from the other side of the fence. And I do feel for everybody who is going through a lot of pain because of the illegal growers, but I'm asking you to please not paint us with the same brush. So we submitted our application to Health Canada in 2016 and have basically spent, since then, putting a yonder together. We did the entire application ourselves, so we didn't outsource it to anybody, so we know exactly what we've committed to. I have, and I can speak for myself, I can't speak for my partners, but I have used up my entire life savings and that of my husband's getting this business off the ground. The reason why I got into this business is because I got sick and the only thing that, meant, that changed my life, I, I would have been in a wheelchair if it wasn't for cannabis. So I believe in this product and I believe in the healing potential of this um, product. Uh, we were notified by Health Canada at the beginning of last year that we could go ahead and build. And um, we've been working with Norfolk County Matt and his team every step of the way. Matt, I know you know our name well, uh, for many years. Um, and then when Health Canada introduced the Cannabis Act, um, we were grandfathered in and uh, when they made the new, when they made changes to the new laws um, saying that you have to have an entire building up 
before you can put in your application. They grandfathered, grandfathered us in under the, um, under the old application. So something, a couple of things I want to point out, and, and I think everybody needs to be realistic about cannabis. So over the last three years, the cannabis industry has become very crowded. So um, there are licenses being issued every day. I think we're up to about 170 licenses with approximately 800 still in the queue. And as per Health Canada and various news channels and newspaper articles, on the 18th of June, there will be a surplus in, can in, in Canada of cannabis. This in turn will drive the prices down and these, driving the prices down will affect everybody, right down to the grower. This business is an incredibly expensive business to get in upfront. It costs an unbelievable amount of money. So this business is not the lucrative business it used to be. Uh, Canopy in Smith Falls, yes, Aurora in Edmonton, Africa in Leamington, yes, everybody made a lot of money, but it is not what it used to be. So today, if one is serious about getting into this business, and more importantly, staying in this business, you need to have a very strict business plan. You need to know exactly where every single dollar is going every single day. Otherwise, you are not going to stay in this business. So a couple of things I want to point out about Ayanda. We specifically decided to put our facility in Norfolk County because of the agricultural land. We had a lot of opportunities to put our facility in industrial areas. We could have um, bought industrial or leased industrial buildings. People would have been very happy to lease those to us, but we chose to do it in an industrial area. We raised investment funds for our business based on a company valuation of $30 million. This is a $30 million company in Norfolk County. We we'll feel comfortable about this um, valuation because of our team, and this is important. This is where it comes back to agriculture versus industrial. Our team consists of Dr. DJ Cook. Some of you may know of him. He was Gord Downey's um, neurosurgeon. He's also one of Canada's top 40 under 40. We have Dr. Joe Buffet, who is a radiologist at St. Mike's Hospital. We have another doctor in chemistry, who I can't share with you yet, but he's pretty well known. And we have the only board-certified radionuclear pharmacist in Canada. Why this is important, okay, is because none of these doctors will be doing their work on the site. We will grow the product for them, but all of the R&D will be done in the various medical facilities around the country. So whether that be St. Mike's Hospital, the Primate Lab at Kingston University, Kingston Hospital, Halifax Hospital, and um, the nuclear um, uh, lab in, at, uh, in London. I um, can't remember the name of the hospital. So all that we're going to be doing in Norfolk County is growing the product. But to date, we have invested $2 million in the county with an additional $3 million to be spent by March of this year, uh, March of next year, with an additional $4 million that will be invested in the county probably within the next six months after that. So in total, once our facility is up and running, we would have spent an, a eight million dollars investing in the county. Think of what we're doing for the county. So with Dr. DJ Cook heading up, he's our chief medical officer. Think of how he's going to put Norfolk County on the map. We have plans to go global with our research and development. Coming back to what you said about the tax. If you can give me a commitment that we are not going to pay more in fees, I have no issue with becoming industrial, but I need to have the commitment that it's not going to cost us more. We have put together a business plan. We are professional people and we have put together a very, very comprehensive business plan. And every single dollar is accounted for. And it is difficult to get funding to get into this business now because it is crowded. So if you would like Norfolk, Delhi to become the cannabis capital on, in a legal framework. We're legal. We're doing this by the book. That's why it's taken us so long. Please don't be short-sighted because if you're going to make it difficult, already as it is, everybody has to put up their entire facilities. I understand that you have problems with illegal players, but don't paint us with the same brush because it has a direct financial impact on us 
and we believe that we have the team and we have the structure to make a difference to Norfolk County in a very positive way. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak in opposition or in general? I'm a little bit taller. Uh, my name's Tara. I'm also from a pre-licensed producer. I am one of the co-founders of Canary. We have a 40,000 square foot facility here in Simcoe. Uh, we have about 25 staff. Most of them are locals or have relocated to Norfolk County for their position with us. Uh, just like the last speaker, we submitted our application in 2014 and we've spent five years trying to meet Health Canada's regulations in order to get licensed. I just also wanted to quickly reiterate, reiterate what the mayor was saying um, about why cannabis is grown indoors because I'm hearing a little bit of misinformation. Um, Cross-pollination has nothing to do with why cannabis is actually grown indoors in a facility. The reason why we have to build these crazy facilities and spend crazy amounts of money on these facilities is because of quality control regulations enforced by Health Canada. And that's all actually changing. Those regulations are being relaxed and we're going to see a lot more outdoor production of cannabis in the future. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is I really want to distinguish between licensed producers like Canary and the personal use production operations that I've heard everyone talking about here today. Uh, Health Canada treats licensed producers very differently than they treat these unlicensed, unregulated, basically, personal use production licenses. Uh, one of them is essentially unregulated, and I, I, I drive past one of them on my way to work uh, every day. It's on Highway 24, and it stinks. And I don't blame people for being offended by that, particularly if you lived in the area. And my problem is that I just don't want those pr production facilities to be conflated with legal ones. Um, the main difference between us and them is that we are heavily regulated by the federal government. And one of those regulations, and probably the key one after sitting and listening to everyone today, is that we have to use air filtration for odor control. Um, additionally, we have to conduct a community impact evaluation, which includes an analysis of our proximity to schools, residences, permission from local authorities, and of course, municipal zoning approval. Uh, we also have phys physical security regulations such as cameras, motion detectors, those fences that were brought up earlier. All of those measures were introduced to protect the community from cannabis when it was still being treated as a medical controlled substance. It's no longer a medical substance, it's considered recreational and we don't have these same kinds of controls when we look at the production of hops or other ingredients that are used in recreational substances. Uh, we also have to obtain personal security clearances and criminal background checks for all of our staff. We don't allow consumption on the premises. We don't have any signage or advertising and we're subject to random inspections from Health Canada. So in other words, in order to obtain a license in the first place, LP applicants have already been comprehensively vetted by the federal government. On the other hand, these personal use production licenses that we are constantly associated with are essentially unregulated. So from the perspective of Canary, our position is that measures enforced to control personal use production licenses like the one that I have to drive past and I don't even have to live near it on Highway 24 should not unfairly impact licensed producers that already face many obstacles to meeting Health Canada's complex regulatory requirements. And from my understanding, there are many other measures that could be used by local municipalities enforcing existing bylaws on these personal use production license operations. One of the other things that I wanted to address or I ha while I have the opportunity to speak today is that there are a diversity of license classes. Uh, I noticed on the um, agenda for today that it's production and processing, but it, that's really oversimplified. Uh, we have cultivation licenses, processing, sale, nursery, and analytical testing. Um, so when considering the appropriate zoning for a cannabis facility, I would think that it's also important to consider the subclass of license and the activities that are actually taking place in the facility. 
So a holder of a cultivation license will primarily be growing and harvesting cannabis with the ancillary activities of packaging and storage and shipping. It seems logical to me that such a facility would be classified as agricultural. In contrast, a holder of a processing license would primarily be extracting, formulating, packaging, storing, and I would never argue for a facility like that to be treated as agricultural when it's clearly industrial. What complicates things is that most license applicants have a combination of these subclasses. So Canary, for example, is applying for a cultivation, a processing, and a sales license. We have a 40,000 square foot facility, 30,000 square feet or 75% of which is used for cultivation exclusively, and the remaining is for ancillary facilities like washrooms, maintenance, offices. So the processing that will be taking place at our facility is basically enables us to, instead of packaging cannabis in a big plastic bag like this, we can put it in a little container that you can sell at the OCS, so, or the Ontario Cannabis Store. So that is the extent of the processing that will be happening in our facility. So our primary activities will remain breeding, growing, harvesting, packing, and shipping. And I would argue that that's just like any other farmer. So I suppose in summary, Canary proposes that bylaws governing licensed producers should be fair and logical and acknowledge the diversity of cannabis licensed subclasses and the actual activities that are taking place in the facility. And I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I would like to wrap up with a bit of an anecdote. And five years ago, a little known startup named Tweed wanted to build out a cultivation facility in the Ottawa Valley, but restrictive zoning made an alternate location, Smith's Falls, more viable. Tweed, now known as Canopy Growth Corp, has grown to become the biggest cannabis company in the world with a market cap of $18 billion, 5 million square feet of production space and more than 4,000 employees. So I guess the moral of the story is that Norfolk County needs to decide whether it wants to support and welcome cannabis companies with logical and fair zoning practices or whether it wants to create restrictive zoning that makes the neighbouring municipalities more favourable. And if zoning bylaws are restrictive, those abandoned greenhouses and warehouses, like the one that Canary built out, will remain abandoned, and it'll be the surrounding municipalities that benefit from the social and economic impacts of cannabis cultivation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Greg France, uh, 680 Townsend Concession Road 14. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, first, I want to, to to just state that I think that this council and um, uh, county planning has been a uh, very um, a big proponent on the support of part one facilities. Um, and I don't think anyone is painting anything with, with one brush versus another. Um, and I believe just to confirm with uh, Mr. Vaughn, you, Mayor, that renaming this to an industrial zone um, does not cause any changes in the way that these cannabis policies are currently being enforced or will be perforced, enforced in the future, nor does it have any um, Okay, we were detriment speaking in on, general, the yep. time for speaking in opposition. Yep. I'm not speaking, favor, I'm rather. speaking just in general, that I feel the county has been a very big proponent of, of uh, medical marijuana. Um, and I also just want to say, um, in general, um, the particular production facility in Tweeds is one of the biggest problem cases in uh, Ontario as far as neighboring um, communities. So, um, but I just want to bring up those general points. Okay. Does anyone else wish to speak uh, in opposition or in general? Good afternoon, my name is Bruce Dagg, I'm also part of Ayanda. Uh, it's more of a point of clarity, the gentleman that you, you mentioned. I just wanted to make sure that I heard that correctly, that you felt that cannabis was still a controlled substance? Okay, unfortunately we can't ask any questions. Well, it's, it's not a, that's what you said, it's not a controlled substance, and so you cannot put it, throw it in, use that argument to throw it into that category. So I am 
I'm against this proposal, and to have that as an argument, I counter that I have both the 1999 uh, controlled substances regulations and the 2018 ones, and it shows clearly that cannabis under the one was under the illicit list, and today, aside from um, synthetic cannabis, it is not uh, on the illicit, illicit list, so, so I, I counter that argument. It, it, it's not valid, and so I stand by my argument that I do, I do oppose this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone wish, else wish to speak in general or in opposition? Okay. With that, then, we will close uh, the public meeting. Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favour? Okay, and that's carried. <clears throat> I guess for myself, I just want to make a couple comments in, in terms of councillors as they go to, to make their decision. The, the decision that we're making is whether or not this is an industrial product, in our view, or whether it's not. Looking at other farms that are in Norfolk County, is this somehow different than the other agriculture that we're seeing? For myself, arguments like barbed wire and the fact that it's inside a building and cross-pollination do not indicate an industrial use. Uh, the federal government would not look at that, and that's up, not up to Norfolk County to make new laws or new definitions as to what a product might be. I just had a question I wanted to ask Councillor um, Columbus, actually, because we were at the OMAFRA uh, facility, um, the Guelph University Research Center, that was it, it was largely funded by OMAFRA, was it not? Or was it completely funded by OMAFRA? University of Guelph Research Facility is primarily funded through OMAFRA funds through the Ontario government. And would you be able to just um, uh, sort of, I guess, verify my, the following statement for the rest of council that actually one of the research centers in that facility now is for cannabis? There, there is a position by the uh, uh, an extension agronomist, I believe it is the title, that works there that uh, works on cannabis. That's true. Thank you. And in 1994, I was actually involved with introducing hemp as a crop here in Ontario and Canada. I remember when Eugene Whelan had put it through the Senate as a crop. So. And, and that was agricultural back then? Yes, that was field hemp. Okay, that was primarily for making, looking at making paper, paper and cloth, that type of thing. As a matter of fact, Alex Tilley made me the first hemp coat and the first hemp hat which I still have, but I can't fit into it. <laughs> well, I hope we see more of it in the future. <laughs> okay, any further questions from councillors? Councillor, wow, that's a lot of hands at once. Councillor Huffman. I guess my question is, um, I think this council is very clear in terms of the, the different facilities. There's, there's no question with that. Um, my question is, how do we guarantee that there is not a change in what individuals are charged if it becomes agri uh, industrial as opposed to agricultural. I know you said you had a discussion with MPAC, but I would like some kind of concrete evidence that it's not going to affect the producers, the LPs. Through the mayor, we, we like I said, we had the discussion with um, our tax department and how taxes are calculated. They are not calculated using zoning bylaws. Um, what they're, they're, they're calculated based on use and that use isn't determined by those agencies because of our zoning bylaw. This amendment will not have any effect on the Part 1 facilities. In fact, the, the folks that came here from the Part 1 facilities or the licensed producers, they've been fantastic to work with. Ayanda won a site plan award last year. Um, we, we've got some really positive things happening in the county with our licensed producers. Um, this isn't uh, going to affect them. It's, the, the idea is to try to control some of the other facilities that are in the county. Um, yeah. yeah leave it at that. Uh, Councillor uh, Van Passen, then Councillor Martin, Councillor Taylor. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I've been following this sort of whole process back from 2018 and before. I remember making a deputation to the Council of the Day um, arguing that the federal government should make it a pharmaceutical or industrial crop because the only 
then at least the municipality gets the benefit of extra taxes. And here I am a year and a half later trying to uh, decide whether that was a good idea to say that and have it on record back then. Because uh, just because MPAC sets the tax rate, it's a pretty easy argument to make that while well, the municipality says it's industrial, so it must be industrial, and then where does that leave the individual to argue it? And that's not a small jump. That is, uh, I'd have to get the treasurer to verify this, but it's about seven times the amount of taxes they have to pay. Is that correct? Uh, more than about 1.69 rather than uh, 175. But, um, you know, is that the only thing that would close some mysterious loophole that I haven't quite figured out? Like, I do understand the whole uh, concept of the argument to say that, well, I used to grow tomatoes in that greenhouse, so now I can grow another agricultural crop, but we already defined it that it's specifically not an agricultural crop, it's something different. That was done, I think, the previous term of council, that they, they pulled it out of that definition of agriculture and changed it. Um, I'm just not so sure what this last little change is supposed to do, so I will sit back and listen some more, and uh, maybe somebody can explain it better than I, or maybe I just don't get it, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Columbus. Councillor Martin. Uh, I just wanted to bring forward some comments from an individual that couldn't be here tonight, and I noticed it as well. And the, the one thing that we haven't discussed um, when we talk about specifically Part 2 facilities has been the enforcement. And, and I believe Tara mentioned she had strategies for enforcement and what that could look like. But you know, one individual who couldn't be here today, um, they operate um, within our bylaw. And they, they wrote to me and said, you know, it's my understanding that there's about 50 plus greenhouses in Norfolk that are currently not complying. And, and we're making this change and staff's recommending this change so that um, the claim is they're, you know, legal, there's no loophole on this legal non-conforming anymore. And their question was, they feel as though that this is creating more red tape when, when they'd rather see this council do and staff do is discuss enforcement um, to work with the people instead of adding more red tape and bureaucracy to the process. And that's just something that we haven't had an opportunity to speak on. Councilor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through you to Mr. Vaughn. I'm still a little unclear on how this will not affect the LPs. I don't want to speak for them, but I think that I can see some fate by the faces that, that there's still that confusion how this isn't going to affect them. So I'm just wondering if you could dive a little bit deeper into that for me. Uh, I'll, through the Mayor to Councillor Taylor, I'll do my best. Uh, and, and I might defer some of this question to James for account number tax more purposes because you'll be better at explaining it than me so and if if MPAC were to change this for Norfolk County MPAC would have to change this for the entire province of Ontario this isn't a, a Norfolk uh, isolated thing they wouldn't look at our zoning bylaw they don't look at other municipalities zoning bylaws to make their tax classification very similar to Hydro One, they won't, Hydro One doesn't look at each municipality's zoning bylaw, so we could call these circuses and they still wouldn't change the, the zoning the, or, or the classification of how they um, regulate hydro or how they regulate tax. It, they have their own system for doing that. If in the future they want to make that change, they would do it, but it would be province-wide. It would not be a Norfolk isolated thing. Um, Perhaps James would like to, to add to some of that. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Council. Uh, you, uh, Matt, you explained it very well. Uh, MPAC uh, has the authority to assess uh, properties uh, on how they think uh, it should be, what the value is, and also the tax class. So we have, um, we have tax classes, and then we have uh, what we're talking about tonight, and they're two different things. Uh, you can have... Um, you can have uh, in an industrial area you can have uh, residential homes there and they will be taxed as a residential rate it's probably not a good example but it happens so uh, as far as how um, 
how individuals will be taxed, uh, that is uh, up to MPAC to do that. It's an arm's length, it's done that on purpose, so municipalities don't have any influence on the tax process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. If I could just, um, I pulled up a couple of articles that have come out uh, most recently, actually, in relation to um, the classification between industry or agriculture, and specifically it refers in one section to uh, taxation purposes. Um, it says that cultivation and production of cannabis at either a commercial or individual level is regulated by the federal government. It is Health Canada's uh, responsibility. But business activities take place in, in municipalities and they have the responsibility to manage land use designations and zoning. Flowing from this and provincial legislation, assessors face the task of classifying property for tax purposes as well as determining the appropriate assessment. Then the municipality sets the resulting tax rates within its jurisdiction. Growing cannabis is essentially an agricultural activity, whether it's in a new purpose-built greenhouse or a repurposed former industrial plant in an industrial zone. Either way, it is the growing of plants, but is it farming? Question mark. Sure, we've long had commercial greenhouse operations for fruits and veggies, but the ramp up of commercial cannabis production is a huge undertaking and nothing less than a gold rush. It's not so straightforward, at least in the eyes to some, to simply apply to cannabis production what might already apply to an existing greenhouse operation for fruits and vegetables. Um, it goes on to say that in Alberta, as an example, uh, cannabis production is viewed as farming even in a greenhouse, and gets a tax exemption. In the Ontario, the Assessment Act is rather vague. It defines farming as including the tillage of land, and the use of word includes is permissive and subject to extension and does not specifically exclude the growing of things in a greenhouse. Ontario's farm regulations and farm organizations avoids its own definition of a farming business and instead passes the buck to the Federal Income Tax Act. Um, that states that farming includes tillage of soil, livestock raising, or exhibiting, maintaining of horses for racing, so on and so forth. It goes on to say that that would suggest the cultivation of cannabis for whatever purpose should be considered a farming activity and any such facility or acreage used to produce it be designated agricultural for assessment purposes, even if it's taken in an industrial zone. After all, are, most, are not most farms today, regardless of what they produce, commercial businesses that are industrial in scale? And so for me, it's the arguments that I'm hearing that it's because of the buildings or because of cross-pollination or because of a particular type of fencing that that is going to, to, to determine potentially, we don't know the changes that, that could come in the future. And to Councillor Van Passen's point, what we're doing is we're providing further support for the government to go and make a change on tax uh, assessments and so on in the future. And what we're trying to do here is create an industry, a, a, a responsible and legal industry with the growers that we have and to you know, develop programs with Fanshawe and with the University of Guelph. And I just, I can't reiterate enough that I don't see how this closes the loop on the part two designators. And, and again, certainly you, there will not be anybody that will advocate more strongly uh, to close that loop. But again, that's got to come from the federal government making changes and not Norfolk County adding red tape. That's f for what? You know, I just, I don't, I don't see the argument there still. Councillor Van Passen and Councillor Roberts. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to end this discussion because I, you, I, I can't see how this puts a quiver in our, uh, or another arrow in our quiver to solve the problem. I think we just close the debate on this point and start the debate on the enforcement. I think the Deputy Mayor brought that up. Um, we have those problems. Um, and again, this is under the Planning Act. Uh, do we just uh, ignore it or defer it or not approve the staff recommendation? Um, and I think we, we uh, one of the uh, Remember, the public brought up the fact that we talk about uh, production and processing, but they are separate things. And, you know, maybe there is some room to look at, like, I don't think we're there yet, but soon there will be the processing facilities coming on that are going to make little gummy bears and all that. And is that separate from the actual production uh, as an agriculture, but the processing part does become industrial. Where is that line? So maybe staff would look into that. So should we defer sort of this whole thing to let them look at those other options on the four different types of licensing, or do we just turn it down? Uh, I'd look for some direction on that and 
when somebody gives me the direction, I would be happy to make a motion to that effect. My comments on that end would be would, there would be no sense debating gummies right now as to whether or not they fall under agricultural or industrial use because they're not even legal yet in the country. So until that time happens or that we see that um, pending, then it, it is. But there's likely, you know, I'm, again, this should be the federal government that this is this requires going to the feds and doing some lobbying with our views of council and what can what else can we do on the enforcement side? How can we make our bylaws stronger? What can we do for enforcement? Um, but just reclassification of this to an agricultural product, I don't see it as doing it. But Councillor Taylor, sorry, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, oh, sorry, Councillor Rabbits, it was you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had three points that I'd like to touch on, some discourses taken place. Um, first, regarding the arrow in our quiver. This will empower our staff to defend us at LPAT um, when these facilities are disputed, and they will be. There will be multiple um, appeals put forward to that body, and we need to empower our municipal staff to defend those. This could be quite costly to us as a municipality and to each and every taxpayer if we don't have that ability uh, to, to defend uh, the appropriate zoning designation uh, that's taking place in these land uses. So I want to get that out there into the debate that we could be looking at very costly appeals to LPAT should we make the wrong decision here today and I feel that decision would be to keep it in the agricultural um, zoning. Um, I want to ask a question of Marlene Miranda in the health department here and I want to address some of the comments that were made about the medicinal properties uh, of cannabis, appreciating that there is recreational usage uh, but I believe this to be a miracle drug. It is used to treat some very serious illnesses. I'm referring to cancer treatment. It helps those stomach food that are unable to eat. Those that suffer from seizures. I know CPD oils uh, have been used to help those uh, that suffer from seizures and some other serious ailments. I know that Health Canada, we've heard that uh, cannabis has some negative effects depending on how it's consumed, if it is smoked not good to ingest that product, but there are legitimate medical uses for this uh, miracle drug, as I'll refer to it as. We've heard about all the different doctors that are involved in the production, cultivation, quality control of the product, and their input is very valuable in classifying this as a pharmaceutical grade product. Oh, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not in debate, sorry. Um, and my question too. Uh, Marlene Miranda is what are the known health benefits of cannabis and could that be viewed as a pharmaceutical product? Uh, through the chair, I can't comment specifically on the health benefits. It's not an area of expertise for me. I can definitely bring something back to council uh, with that information. I understand there are uh, health benefits. Uh, one of the disadvantages is the combustible um, in inhalation, which we would not recommend. So I'm happy to bring something back to, count, um, to council. I'm happy to discuss it with Dr. Nessa Thurre and the team and bring that for, forward to, to council as requested. Thank you for that, Marlene. Uh, again, this is a, uh, um, a drug that is prescribed by medical doctors, and that's just a point that I wanted to uh, drive home in my, my comments. My next question is actually directed towards Matt um, regarding some of the comments that we've had about the industrial uses, that there is cultivation, there's the growing of plants, there's also the processing aspect and those subclasses, and I was hoping that you could maybe elaborate um, or validate those classes that are going to be closer in fidelity to an industrial or pharmaceutical use, respecting that there are some applications that are simply growing a plant. But in the subclasses that we've heard, and we've had acknowledgement from those tier one producers that I do want to sing their praise, they're doing a very good job of um, creating this uh, new cannabis industry in Norfolk County, which we will be leaders in. Uh, regardless of the outcome here today, I do believe that to be true. What about these subclasses and how do they fall into uh, the recommendations contained in your report, Matt? Uh, through to Mayor to Councilor Rabbits, they, there definitely are subclasses. Uh, our zoning bylaw definition um, doesn't capture all of them. It's meant and intended to be a, a general 
definition um, for us to start getting into the weeds per se as to all of the different subclasses of licenses what might might get a little complicated it's something that we may consider in the future particularly around the nursery end of things um, is a cannabis nursery right now can only supply plants to other licensed producers whether that is going to remain the same in the future maybe a nursery might be able to supply plants to a, a home user there there's so many different directions things could go in um, that for now it's likely staff will, will will wait to see how things evolve and we'll try to be as proactive as we can and that's the intent of tonight's discussion is to be as proactive as we can and we'll continue to monitor things as we move through uh, the evolution of the industry to, to remain proactive but to remain permissive as well. We have, I want to say it's the most robust cannabis policy probably in Canada, but it's not just robust in, in, in terms of how it regulates. It's robust in terms of how we've anticipated the industry to change as well. For instance, um, Council recently approved tourism in, in, on cannabis production and processing sites. No one else has done that yet. So we're positioning ourselves to be the capital for cannabis production, processing, cultivation, research, nursery, everything, all the different classes. Um, and it's going to be a very exciting time in Norfolk in the future. Thank you, Matt. And if I may make one more parting comment, um, I'm fully prepared to move the motion as presented if I have some colleagues that feel that maybe it'd be more prudent for us to defer this matter so we can find out more about those subclasses, get some more information. Um, I, I believe I heard some of that language from across the table. Uh, that may be prudent. Uh, it may be prudent for us to deal with this issue now as it's before us and we do have quite a bit of information uh, to digest. I just feel that we're at the precipice here of creating a new emergent industry, a cannabis industry here in Norfolk County. I had the opportunity to participate in some development and cultural services roundtables uh, pertaining to the economic development strategic plan. Uh, that was previously presented to council and cannabis uh, production actually came up as a topic of interest in the emergent industries uh, roundtable. Everyone uh, in attendance at that particular roundtable felt that this is a new emergent industry that needs more attention and, and needs our, our support as a community. I didn't hear a lot of commentary regarding to the agricultural applications. It was viewed as a new emergent industry and very exciting and uh, that was sort of the line of um, commentary during those, those round tables and I just want to acknowledge that I was present and I was party uh, to those conversations. I was not at the agricultural round table and if there was any uh, counselors present at that uh, round table, I'd be very interested in hearing uh, what that roundtable came up with in terms of is this an agricultural product, is it industrial, and maybe what our public's view was uh, in that regard. I believe that we're on the cusp of making a, a major decision. I don't think we should be making it rashly. And uh, currently I am in favor of what's before us here, but if I have colleagues that feel like they need more information, absolutely I'd want to feel that you had in, all the information you had uh, required available for you to make that informed choice. Thank you. Councilor Rabbit. The only thing I would like to add is I did make a call uh, to Haldeman next door that we often speak about, and uh, they have continued uh, to classify this as an industrial product next door. Councilor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, one of the good things about the Planning Act, they actually force us to make a decision, right? We either have to say yes or no. So I will put forth a motion that the recommendation on whatever DCS 1978 not be approved and if that gets a seconder and it gets uh, approved we have made a decision if it gets turned down then somebody has to make the opposite motion right? so, so I will put uh, that could you clarify on. you're moving the staff recommendation that it not be approved or be approved no, I'm moving that uh, the recommendation under DCS 19.78 not be approved. Not be approved. Okay. Is there a seconder? Councillor Michelli. And can I request a recorded vote? <clears throat> Councillor Columbus. You do have a move and a seconder, and I know a deferral takes precedence over a motion. Right, Mr. Clerk? So I will uh, move that we defer the decision for further information from uh, Mr. Vaughn with respect to trying to come up with uh, 
a different, better definition for industrial versus what we've got. Okay. <clears throat> Is there a seconder for the deferral? Councilor Rabbits. All those in favor? Okay. It's carried. Councilor Martin. It was more of a question for me. What, what are we asking for? What are we asking for uh, definition wise from industrial? Um, <laughs> Councilor Rabbits? Or Councilor Columbus, I suppose, perhaps if you could. Okay. As I understood it, um, we we're requesting more information, particularly regarding to the subclasses, as there is uh, subclasses that uh, have more fidelity to agricultural use, and we have subclasses that, acknowledged by our uh, producers, uh, have more fidelity with an, an industrial application. And we're hoping to have some information on that topic and others that were discussed this evening that we may not have a straight answer for. I know Marlene Miranda was going to get back to us with some information uh, from a health perspective and what the impacts on public health could be. So that was my understanding and supporting the deferral. If I have misunderstood, please do uh, acknowledge. And I feel that if there's counselors here that require some more information, we're going to provide um, our staff an opportunity to present that information in a subsequent report. Okay, I think we have to be clear though. The deferral is only related to whether or not this is classified as industrial or agricultural. So I'm unclear as to directing the health department to provide a report on the medical benefits of cannabis. I think we all agree that there are medical benefits to cannabis. I mean, the research is worldwide. So I'm just, I'm not sure how that changes the agricultural versus industrial view. And that's what we're deferring right now. Uh, respectfully through you uh, to Marlene Miranda, do, do you understand um, the request uh, through the deferral? So through the mayor, through Council Roberts, I wasn't going to create a report, just get general information and circulate it to council. Um, so that should be done within the, by the end of the week, I could have that information to council to help inform whatever decision it is moving forward. Thank you, Marlene. And once we have this exact same report uh, before us, we'll have that information. We'll be able to make an informed choice. Councilor Martin. Uh, it was my understanding that we heard about those other subclassifications, and for the record, I was not supporting a deferral. I was raising my hand for a question. I even myself was confused and started to put my hand up. I was kind of. Okay, uh, anything else from councillors? All right, uh, moving on then. I guess, did you guys want to take a 15 minute break to grab a bite to eat? We'll re reconvene at 7.40.
Um, through you, Mayor Chop, uh, we just, uh, I had a couple members mention that they were a bit confused on what was being voted on for the deferral of that last item. So rather than move on, um, it, uh, since it's raised directly after and we haven't gone to the next uh, matter, we'd probably be safest to re-vote just to ensure everybody knew what they were voting upon. Can we have a recorded vote on deferral? Sure. Yeah, uh, okay. The mayor's asked for a recorded vote, uh, so uh, Councillor Geisens on, def on deferral. Yeah. Councillor Rabbits. Yes. Councillor Columbus. Yes. Councillor Martin. No. Councillor Van Passen. No. Councillor Huffman. Yes. Councillor Michelli. No. Councillor Taylor. No. Mayor Chop. No. Okay, the deferral loses five to four. Councillor Van Passen. Could I then put forth the motion that it be not approved? Okay, so to clarify, the motion's to not be approved. Councillor Michelli is the seconder. Any discussion? Okay, if we could have a recorded vote again. Okay, go the other direction. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Councillor Taylor, yes. Uh, Councillor Michelli. Yes. Councillor Huffman. No. Councillor Van Passen. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Councillor Columbus. No. Councillor Rabbits. No. Councillor Geisens. No. Uh, Mayor Chop. Yes. The yeas carry five to four. Okay, so moving on, I guess, where did you want to jump to? Uh, so the, uh, since, since we have a lawyer here for the um, closed session, we'll do that. Yep, so, oh, sorry, there's one thing. Do you want to, you're welcome to read Sorry, there, I just, I just had to scratch up two things because we were going to do it all at once. Which items on the agenda is this? Twelve A and twelve B. That's bylaws. Oh, sixteen A. Okay, sorry. that's okay. Okay, so um, we are going to move into closed session now for two items, sixteen A and sixteen B. I have a motion that's been moved by Councillor Taylor and seconded by Councillor Geisens that Council move into closed session at seven uh, fifty-two. PM to discuss matters pursuant to sections 239 2A and C and sections 239 3.1 of the Municipal Act 2001 as the subject matter pertains to the security of property of the municipality or local board, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of property by the municipality or local board, litigation or potential litigation including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the local municipality or local board, legal advice subject to solicitor client privilege including communications for that purpose and to hold a training session for council to receive general information upon cannabis issues without advancing the business or decision making in that regard. Uh, all those in favor? And that is carried. 